Shalom. Let's open up with a quick word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you've blessed us with. Thank you, Father God, for allowing me to do this lesson. We come before you right now, Father God, rebuking any attacks by Satan, demons, principalities, fallen angels, spiritual wickedness in high places, rulers of the darkness of this world, powers of the air, or any satanic forces, witches or warlocks, or any human beings that would allow themselves to be manipulated by those forces from coming against me or anybody listening to this lesson who is a member of the body of Christ in Jesus' name. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Excuse me. All right. Um. Okay, so we're going to start this uh, lesson. You saw from the title, it is the Mande, Ghana, and Mali Israelite Kingdoms of West Africa. Um, this should be a good lesson. I've been holding off on dealing with the subject because um, I've been studying these two empires since I was a child, but I didn't want to come out with a lesson until I had all my ducks in a row and I felt comfortable with all of my research which at this point I do, so I'm going to present the lesson. Um, also, uh, I just wanted to make note of um, part of the reasons I do these lessons is because like my people over here in this part of the world that was brought here as slaves to um, the New World, whether it's Latin America, the United States, the Caribbean, um, a lot of us, we don't know anything about our history. And so I hope to help us learn about our history and show us show that we have a rich history uh, with that being said let's just get into the lesson i'm not going to do any inventory stuff this lesson will demonstrate the following the initial empire of ghana was founded by judean refugees or migrants from cyrene circa 200 a.d and cyrene is located in Sib uh, libya um, on the co on the mediterranean coast near its border with egypt Earlier migrants, as well as other Israelite migrants from the Medit from Mediterranean Africa, also settled in the mountainous area between the coast and Sahara before being pushed out. They also settled in the oases of the Sahara. These people are labeled as Proto Soninki or Mande peoples, and we'll um, we'll talk about that um, in the next slide with the key terms. Um, also, re well. I did a lesson on the Kittos War, which kind of um, ties into this part with them leaving Cyrene. Um, I'll link that lesson to the end of this lesson. Next, circa 600 AD, the Mande people migrated from Nubia to the Kingdom of Ghana, which is in modern day Mauritania slash Mali. It's not located where the modern day country of Ghana is. OK, two separate areas close by, but not the same areas. For refuge, along with other groups like the Akan and Timne, to name a few, um, and I cover the Akan's migration in a lesson I did dealing with the Akan, um, Igbo, and Yoruba. I will link that to the end of this as well. Um, when the Yoruba and Igbo were migrating from the same, uh, well, not from Cyrene, but from Nubia, like we were talking, what uh, we were just saying. When they migrated from that area, instead of going into the empire of Ghana, they went towards Nigeria. The Akan went towards the empire of Ghana. The Mande first left the kingdom of Judah circa 700 BC and migrated into Kemet. And of course, there's going to be sources throughout. And if you see a little number by something, that's the source. At the end of the lesson, I will link. Uh, at the end of the lesson, there will also be a reference page with the sources. Um, the Mande first left the kingdom of Judah circa 700 BC and migrated into Kemet. 
The cause was Assyrian attacks and the outline of the snake god they worship, Ningishida Nehushtan Bita by King Hezekiah. Um, we're going to get into that more in depth in the next slide as well, too, when we deal with the key terms. This is just the objective, spelling stuff out. While in Kemet, they were allowed to continue the custom by incorporating it into Egypt, into Egyptian Apep worship, and Apep was the Egyptian snake god. Circa 300 BC, they began migrating into Kush slash Nubia, or Moro, because of Persian, Greek, and later Roman incursions into Egypt. They left Nubia because of the chaotic situation of the time. Um, the lesson I did dealing with the Akan, Yoruba, and um, Igbo goes into a little bit more detail of that chaotic situation. Um, we'll discuss it some later in this lesson of what was going on that caused. There was a lot of things going on in that area at the time. Um, you have religious strife, economic strife, um, the collapsing of kingdoms. There's a lot of stuff that was going on that led to um, mass migrations. After arriving in Ghana, they took over the kingship, starting with Daibe Sise Bendinga. He was the first Soneki king, but um, his father was Dinga, and this was circa 750 AD. Uh, after the collapse of Ghana because of Moorish attacks and famine, they created the Empire of Mali circa 1250 AD, founded by a line of kings descended from Balao, the Ethiopian Israelite of the tribe of Dan. Balao was um, the slave, the Ethiopian slave who um, was one of the Prophet Muhammad's ass assistants in, you know, the Islam story. I'm not Muslim, so I don't know all the full, I don't go into the full details of that. I've studied Islam before. I've read the Quran, but I'm not a Muslim, so I don't want to, I'm not going to attempt to butcher that stuff. But anyways, the Mandinka branch of the, uh, the Mandinka branch of the Mande. Their traditional story says that their kings, if you read the Sundiata epic or the epic of Sundiata, um, who was their first king, the first king of Mali, um, they claim descent from Bilal, who was the Ethiopian slave living, living in Arabia during the time of the rise of Islam. Um, I think he developed the call to prayer for is, uh, for Muslims and some other stuff like that. Um, that's where they claim their kingship came from. Um, I'm not going to debate that. That lines up. Like, it lines up with what we're saying right here with uh, even Daibe Sise coming over, you know, probably around the same time. They say his the, the sons of Balao migrated over to um, West Africa and founded, those, and founded the line of kings. Um, well, eventually, because the first, like, founded the line of kings that Sundiata came from. Uh, but if you want more information on that, you can read the Epic of Sundiata and the Griots in Mali of the Mandinka tell this story all the time over and over. It's um, actually easy to find. Um, was there anything else with that that I wanted to cover? Um, yeah, and then the fact that it's it's out there that um oh and the source that i have it even says that Bilal's son and you can see that on this on the reference page that Bilal's sons migrated to ethiopia and according to mandinka tradition from there they migrated to west africa um the it's also held in some traditions that he was an israelite because the falasha or the ethiopian jews come from the tribe of dan primarily um and so and since he was a slave as well, that lines up with the precepts um, that that are in the Bible. I don't really argue that. It seems plausible to me. I roll with it. If you don't like it, you know, take it up with the Mandinka. That's what they say. I go. I'm not I'm a fan of going with the records of what the people say. If The people got records and it's written down or it's been passed down orally. I try to go with that. All right. Because who knows better than the people themselves, okay? There might be some little stuff that's off here and there because of oral tradition if you didn't write it down. But that doesn't mean you throw the baby out with the bathwater. All right. After the collapse of Mali by the Songhai circa 1450 AD, the Mande were thrown into a state of disarray and many fell victim to the transatlantic slave trade. 
All right, and that's how some of the people over here in the Americas whose ancestors are Mande, that's how you ended up getting over here um, via the slave trade. So I will recommend that you get a pen and pad and take notes because there's going to be a lot of information, and I really mean that. You're going to want to take notes because this is a real detailed lesson. And because these are two kingdoms that, in my opinion, are the greatest civilizations that Africa has produced outside of Egypt, there's a lot of information to cover. So, and basically, this is like a high school level, entry level college um, course on these people and on their history. So, I will really take notes. All right, let's dive on in. So, the first key term is Mande people themselves. Um, and I have their Malinke or people of Male, Male, because that's what Malinke means. Um, we're not going to discuss too much with this with the key terms because the next couple of slides, um, we're, you're going to get a, I'm not going to even say a brief overview. You're going to get a detailed overview on the Mande people. So we'll cover that in those slides for this key term. Um, but I will mention in the la in the objective, I was talking about how Bilal was a Ethiopian Jew who was a slave of um, Ethiopian Israelite, because technically we have to start getting terms and things right. And those of us who are the true Israelites, we need to start correcting things because we are the true people and we need to fix some stuff. So, for example, you're not uh, technically you're only a Jew if you come from the A, the tribe of Judah, or B, the kingdom of Judah. So if you're not of the tribe of Judah, then technically you're not a Jew. Excuse me. You're still an Israelite, but you're not a Jew. That's why Judah and Jew, it goes together. Or you come from the kingdom of Judah. Um, those from the northern kingdom were never referred to like that. So the better term to use is Israelite. And since the Ethiopian, Falasha, most of them, their primary tribe that they came from was a tribe of Dan. Um, he was an Ethiopian Israelite. But the point I wanted to make with that was there's a branch of the Mande people called Dan. And I um, did a short little video on them. I'll see if I'm able to link that one at the end of this as well, because I don't know how many you can only do four. And um, I might run out of um, videos by the end of this to link, but might not. We'll see. But I did a short little like three minute thing on them and showing them being from the tribe of Dan. And their name is actually Dan. So I just wanted to connect that for you, too, as well. You have Bilal's sons migrating to West Africa and eventually establishing a line of kings um, from the Mandinka, which is where we get the kingdom of Mali coming from. Um, and you have a branch of the Mande people called Dan, just... Something to mull over in your mind, okay? Anyways, next, proto Sonaki slash Mande or Heratin or Harati. All right, now that might seem confusing to you, but let's, let's, I want to talk about this. So when you look at, if you study archaeology and you look at the archaeological records, um, there was a couple cities that were um, established in West Africa, like in Mauritania and Western Sahara, like that area. Um like late BC times, early, early AD times. And um, some suggest that those were the proto Soniki or the proto Mande people. Um, the reason that's kind of true, but not true. The reason why I say kind of true, but not true is because the people who established those cities were Israelites, but they weren't the mandate yet because the mandate hadn't migrated there and this is why i said like we have to tell our own stories and get stuff right because the mandate have records especially the the soniki have records of um their ancestry and how they migrated to the area and when you analyze their records and um traditions and you look at the archaeological records the times don't match the, uh for for those cities OK, so these were cities that were established by earlier groups of Israelites who had migrated to that area and had it started establishing um, cities. OK. Um, 
Next, the and the reason why I have their Heriton or Harariotite is you still have a group of people living in Mauritania, Western Sahara, um, Morocco, and I think like southern parts of Algeria called the Heriton. And especially in Mauritania, they form a plurality of the population and they're discriminated against by the Arabs and the Moors that are there. And they have a low caste. They're like they used to be servants and slaves. And some of them still are uh, that you can look this up on your own time. And according to um, the the Berber and Arabic of that area, they say that the name Heriton comes from plowmen and I think something else. But because basically they do work um, these people. But if you look into the record of them, they're related to the Sonaki and Mande people. Look this stuff up there. They are. They're related to them. Um, they've just been living in that area for so long as slaves that, you know, now they're kind of a separate people. But when you look into them, they're related to the Mande people. OK, some of them were part of these proto Seneki. Uh, and Mandate people that I was telling you about, the earlier branches of Israelites who came before the actual Mandate migrated over to the area. And some of them are descendant from Mandate slaves that were taken by the Moors and Turags and other Berbers and brought over there. All right. And I want to point out something because their name actually, Harirati, you can find that in uh, a Hararite, you can find that in the Bible. And it actually means mountain dweller. So if you look at um, on your own time, we're not going to read it. But if you look at 2 Samuel 23, 11, 2 Samuel 23, 33 and 1 Chronicles 11, 35, it has the Strong's Hebrew word H2043, uh, Hararite, which means mountain dweller. Adjective, a resident or descendant of Harar, perhaps perhaps only a mountain dweller. Um. Agi, I don't know what that MPRM, I copied this from, um, where did I copy this from, from the Strong's Hebrew? The, I think it was like Blue Letter Bible. So that was probably something that couldn't be coded over, like a symbol. It's probably like a Hebrew thing that didn't uh, transfer over. Two, Agi, a Hararite, one of David's heroes. Three, Shamama, the Hararite, one of David's heroes. Sharar, the Hararite, the father of Iham. One of David's heroes, origin apparently from H2042. And so the point of this is when you started having um, Israelites first leaving the Mediterranean coast of North Africa, which started happening in full force after the Roman Jewish Wars. So let's say like around, you're talking about your circa 100s AD. Um, first, some of them started settling in the mountainous area between um, between the coastal part and the desert. And I'll use California as an example because that's where I'm at. And it's pretty we have a Mediterranean climate along the coast. But the way it works here is like if you live in Southern California, um, you have the Mediterranean climate and then there's a bunch of mountain ranges. And then once you cross those mountain ranges on the other side is desert. It's the same thing in North Africa um, where you have a Mediterranean climate on the coast because they're in the Mediterranean and then you have mountain ranges. And then once you pass the mountains, you're in the Sahara Desert. When it, when the Israelites first started migrating, some the ones we're dealing with at first, they went to uh, near the River Niger. Uh, that's where the extreme went, like the furthest went with these first groups going out. Other groups, though, settled in the mountains like the Atlas Mountains and other uh, mountainous regions uh, of the Sahara. And others settled in the oases of the um, Sahara. The Hararitan and uh, part of the reason they got their name in Hebrew, because they're like they're Israelites too. look this stuff up. Uh, comes from this Hararitite mountain dwellers, because that's where they were dwelling at at first before they started, before they got pushed out again by um, Berbers and Arabs and stuff that pushed them further south. OK. Next, we want to deal with the other key term. The other key term was Nagiza, Zida, Nehushtan, and I have slash Apep and Beta. So this might confuse you, but let's talk about it. Okay. So as you're going to see further as we go on in this lesson, that um, before the Sonaki converted to Islam, 
their um they were practicing paganism and they were worshiping a snake god you'll find that out later in the lesson from primary source because we're going to go into i'm going to read the traditional story of the sonaki ancestor and you'll find out and it deals with beta the snake god okay the israelites which the sonaki are israelites before there was a branch of israelites that were worshiping a snake god in israel in the bible okay um, and the reason, and it was called Nehushtan, which means brass serpent. And you can find this Strong's Hebrew H5180. The Neginza Zeta is because that is the Mesopotamian snake god. You can look all this, look all this stuff up on your own time as well. Fact check everything I tell you. I mean, I would. I'm not here to mislead anybody. But anyways, that was the name of the Mesopotamian or Babylonian snake god in ancient times. OK, and like I always say, a lot of the all the pagan religions of the ancient world are just recycled versions of the ancient Babylonian pagan religious system that was established by Nimrod. All right. Um. You had a branch of Israelites who started worshiping the snake god, and it's just a continuation of this. When the Sonaki migrated and the Mande, when the Mande people migrated into Egypt, um, they were allowed to still continue worshiping that snake god in the form of Apep, which is the Kemetic version of the snake god. All right, and for just to show you proof of this, because remember in the last slide, I was telling you about how. The Mande people first left Israel circa 700 BC, and that's when they, and then they migrated into Kemet, and from there later they migrated into um, Nubia or Kush or Moro, and then from there they migrated to West Africa. Let's go into the Bible real quick and get the precept for that. Let's look at Second Kings um, chapter 18. I'm reading Second Kings chapter 18. I'm gonna start at verse one. And this is the King James Version as per usual. But 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshiah, son of Eli, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. All right. Remember, Hoshiah is the last king of the northern kingdom before they get taken into captivity by the Assyrians, which took place in 722 B.C., um, and like I always say, remember the kingdom of Assyria, which is really just ancient Mesopotamia, was founded by Nimrod, who was a Cushite. All right. Verse two, 25, 20 and five years old was he when he began to reign. And he reigned 20 and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abby, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, did. And I want to add a caveat when it says that he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. If you those of us who believe in the Bible like me, that's my religion. I'm a Bible believer. They and so I study it. You will know that um, pretty much all the northern kingdom kings did not do right in the sight of God. They practiced paganism and did um, all kind of abominable things with the kingdom of Judah. It was 50 50. It's like half their kings did right. Half their kings. Um, didn't do right. Hezekiah was one of the half who did do right in the eyes of God. Um, verse four, he removed the high places and the high places were just the groves and the places where the Israelites were practicing Canaanite religion. I'm, I'm pointing this out because I've had a couple people when I did the lesson on the Yoruba be like, well, are the Yoruba Canaanites are, you know, descended from Nimrod because of the primary one, because of the primary source I brought out but also because of um, the language, I mean, not the language, the religion and how I talked about the relation between voodoo and the Yoruba religion and ancient Canaanite religion and how the Orishas can all correlate to the ancient Canaanite religion, which in turn can correlate to the ancient Babylonian religion. Well, that doesn't, people, okay. People don't know the history of the Israelites. You got to read the Bible. I don't even even for those of you who don't believe in the, those of you who don't believe in the Bible and don't believe in, the, in um, you know, you don't believe in that and you think it's just a story. You need to read it. You will learn a lot. OK. Um, for example, if you read your Old Testament, you would know that the Israelites constantly 
were inter intermingling with the Canaanites and they never fully took them over. And they were constantly worshiping their gods. And by intermingling, I mean they were marrying each other and living amongst each other. OK, uh, so that's one key way you're going to see like, oh, wherever you have Canaanites, you usually have Israelites. So I've explained before. So that's what this is uh, talking about. They were worshiping Canaanite gods. OK, back to verse four. Um, so I guess the point with that is don't you. A lot of Israelites were not didn't continue practicing keeping the Old Testament religion and later on the early church when the New Testament keeping that religion. A lot of Israelites didn't actually practice that when they migrated. They were still practicing idolatry and paganism. Some were practicing the true religion. Some were practicing paganism. And when they migrated to Africa, they continued to do that. Um, next, back to verse four. He removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days, the children of Israel did burn incense to it. And he called it Nehushtan. And that bronze serpent, that's the serpent that Moses uh, made out of brass and put up in the wilderness. Um, when the Israelites were getting sick, they healed them of their sickness. If they looked upon it, God told them to put it up. And if they looked upon it, they would be healed. That's why here in America today, if you look at most ambulances and hospitals, they'll have like a, a pole or a brass pole with a serpent wrapped around it. Um, it's correlating to that. OK, but the Israelites have started worshiping that and the mandate come from a branch who were worshiping that uh, serpent at that time. And when Hezekiah cleared out all the idols, they didn't like it. If you keep reading on in that chapter, because we're moving on, we don't have time. If you keep reading on in that chapter, you'll see that the Assyrians attacked the northern kingdom and have removed them. And then the Assyrians were trying to attack the kingdom of Judah. And during that time, because of Assyrian pressure and their pagan beliefs being outlawed, you had groups of Israelites who began to migrate into Egypt. OK, fourth, Sunghai. We're going to talk about this later, but I'm going to have to correct an error with uh, Rudolph Windsor from Babylon to Timbuktu. We will deal with that when we get to that section. And then lastly, this one, Maine, um, I'll just cover that briefly in the next slide before we start. OK, and with Maine, I just wanted to cover how um, after the collapse of Mali, you had groups that were labeled the Maine of, um, of Mandate people who started going into other parts, more coastal parts of West Africa, like Sierra Leone, uh, Liberia, other places and started taking over local populations and they were labeled the main people. Uh, I wanted to point out something that you still in America, you still have use of this word and people don't know and of uh, blacks over here who are descendants of slaves from that area. They still use that word as an epithet uh, and don't even realize why they're using it. And I only bring this out because sometimes I've met uh, other Israelites from the diaspora like from West India, from the West Indies, um, Brazil, and even some from West Africa. And something that they'll say about Israelites in the United States is like, how come y'all don't have as much of the traditional culture still being practiced in the United States? Like even compared to Caribbean um, Israelites and like, you know, Afro-Brazilians, how come y'all have less of it? The reason is we had this thing here called integration. And once we integrated into mainstream society, we lost a lot of that stuff. So, for example, if you look at the way that um, Israelites or African-Americans talked in the United States before like the 1930s, it's um, like Jamaican Patois or Creole, the length, the way they talked and just read any read a slave narrative from uh, <laughs> like I could read my 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 great great grandma did a slave narrative uh, herself and if you if I was to read it to you it sounds like Jamaican power like it's it, it's crazy but so integration caused that but there's still little things that are left over like the word gumbo okra um, even in the south the term bubba like Bubba is a term in the South used for like an older brother or the oldest male child or your older brother. That comes from the fact that a lot of the slaves had a problem pronouncing the R word, the same coming from Africa, the way that the Europeans or the English was using it to say brother. 
So brother came out Bubba. Over time, the the white started using that word as two two, and it became a part of Southern culture. Just like the banjo, which is a Bantu word and was brought over from the Congo, became a part of the American lexicon. Well, today you have even with rappers like Gucci Mane or whatever Mane, and then like in the South the slang, they'll talk like Mane. I can't believe that happened. Mane, oh Mane. These are leftovers from when you were in West Africa and the Maine were coming and attacking. That was a term that was viewed in a negative light. So you still use that today over here in America without you even realizing it. Okay, I just wanted to point that out. Those of us here in the United States, we do still have some of the traditional culture stuff still being practiced today. You just have to dig a little deeper. All right. Uh, now, this is from the first, this is the first source, and you can find, I'll have the reference for it on the reference page. Um, that's where all of this is coming from at this portion. The other sources are also on the reference page, but before we get into them, I will list them on their own individual slides so you know what we're talking about. But this one, if you want the source, we got to get to the reference page. It's like the Encyclopedia of African and Middle Eastern ethnic groups or whatever. I use this source a lot. Uh, and we're just going to read their information on the Monday. If you remember from the key terms, I said I was going to define the Monday people and that it wasn't going to be, but I wanted to wait because it wasn't going to be a brief overview. It was going to be a detailed overview. So this is a detailed overview on the Monday people. And I feel like we have to get the overview before we dive deeper into the lesson because like I said, I don't know the the levels of my audience. We I have some people on high levels. I have other people on lower levels. And so I have to meet somewhere in the middle. So I don't know how much everybody knows. So we're just going to cover all the bases. OK. Mande is a large language group spread throughout much of West Africa from the Niger River and the Sahara in the east to the Atlantic Ocean in the west. There are several related peoples who speak varieties of Mande numbering five to six million and it's probably way more than that numbering five to six million and living in mali guinea ivory coast gambia senegal guinea Bissau, barinka faso sierra leone and liberia whoop whoop liberia yeah anyways if y'all those who follow me know my connections with liberia i had ancestors that went back there from mississippi the Mande language belongs to the West Atlantic branch of the Niger Congo family, and its original home most likely is in the area near the border between modern Mali and Guinea. Most of the Mande speaking peoples call themselves people of Mali. For example, Malinke, Maninka, and Mandinka, Nika, Nike being the word for people. Other Mande speakers include the Bambara, the Soniki, the Daula, meaning trader, who are not the same as, di as the Diola of Casamance region of Senegal, and the Mende. Uh, and the Mende, that's where a lot of the slaves, the Mande slaves that were brought over here to the United States, that's where um, a lot of us come from. Um, that group and that has to do with some things that we'll get into later in the lesson hopefully if we have time Mande origins are in the ancient chiefdom called Mandan the Mande founded some of the most powerful and important states in West African history and right there that's why I wanted to take my time with this lesson and make sure I had all my ducks in a row proper research and all of that before I even tried to tackle this because I had people been asking me like are the Mandinka Israelites or the Mande Israelites? What do you say? What do you, are you going to do a lesson on that? And I'm like, maybe, I don't know. Like, uh, let me research. You know what I'm saying? Cause I, I'm not on here. I'm not on here to do pseudo documentaries. And like, I call them, me and my wife call them third eye documentaries. Like, Oh, I'm opening up your third eye on some, and on some weird stuff. No, like I'm here just to present factual stuff. You know, none of that. Like just recently, I, I'd seen an Israelite pastor talking about now he's saying the earth is flat. We got all I'm not on here for that kind of weirdo stuff, dude. No, like <laughs> like this is where and, you know, sometimes you watch these YouTube videos and they're giving you information and they got music and stuff playing in the background and different things. All, I'm going to let you in on a secret. You. Music put in the background of a lesson when someone's trying to teach you something, 
is to lull you. It's a tactic. I'm not here for that. I'm here to present information and hopefully you take it. If you don't want to take it, that's on you. But I'm just presenting factual historical information. No agenda. All right. I do this out of love. Like I just love history. And this is a hobby of mine. I, when I have free time, I like to put these lessons together. OK. Um, you know, I got to do something <laughs> like I went to school for history. And so I like it. And so anyways. The Mande founded some of the most powerful and important states in West African history. In the 6th century, the Sonaki founded the first of these great kingdoms, Wagadu or Wagdugu, which the Arab geographers called Ghana, located in the southeast of today's Mauritania. They most likely took their group name from the title of the king. All right. And before we go into the next slide uh, with this, I also wanted to say Someone, there's a person, because comments are public, and this person's name is Rhonda. You send, uh, and your comment didn't make it public, so I'm not outing you because you sent a comment. If it would have, if I would have um, approved it, because all my comments get filtered because there's too much hate stuff on YouTube, and I'm not about that. I'm about Christ. Christ is not about hate. Christ is not about that. Christ is about love, and he's not about hate. When he returns for his second coming, he's going to be coming for judgment and he's going to be angry and a lot of people are going to get slaughtered. That is true. But that's in the future and that's not dealing with now and that has nothing to do with us. He's going to do that. So in the meantime, we need to be treating each other as believers and followers of Christ. You need to treat others how you would want to be treated. And this person was like, sent me a comment talking about all Yoruba women are ugly because I have made a comment about how I not a comment. I one of my le in the lesson I did about the Yoruba, um, I said that I find Yoruba women to be attractive. I said my wife has Yoruba features. We're pretty sure she descends from the Yoruba. Uh, and I was like, that's and her women, the women in her side of the and her side of the family on her paternal side favor Yoruba. And she was like, this person Rhonda was like, oh, Yoruba women are ugly, and went into this discourse about it. Um, the tribalism over there in Africa, man, y'all need to stop that, dude. It's, it doesn't benefit anybody and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't help anybody. The other thing that I wanted to say was, um, this lesson is going to, is going to be a part of a series and I'm going to create a playlist. I did a lesson called American, um, Israelite slaves in American South. It was only like 30 minutes and I'm putting this stuff together for my people over here in the United States because we don't have. A lot, like I said, we don't, a lot of us don't know anything about our history. We think we don't even have an ancient history when we do. So I'm going to create a playlist. The first one, the first lesson is going to be that one on Israelite slaves in the American South. And in that lesson, I um, broke down the six groups that most um, African Americans are the descendants of slaves here in the United States came from in Africa. And, um, you know, the Israelite groups from over there that they came from. And so the six groups were the Mande, the Bakongo people, the Fong people, the um, the Yoruba people, the um, Akan people, and the Igbo people. I've already done lessons on the Akan, Igbo, and Yoruba. I'm doing this one on the Mande, so I only have two more left to do on the Bakongo and Fong. Because I'm in the process of starting a church, um, those two lessons will not be done till sometime um next year according to the babylon calendar january i go off of a hebrew calendar uh, which is lunar but according to the babylon calendar you know january is the start of new year that won't happen until sometime after january but just letting you know i'm putting these together into that uh into a series of lessons and in that way you know pretty much all of us over here in the united states that are descendants of slaves either directly descend either patrilineally from one of those six groups or you're going to have some admixture a large admixture of those six groups because that's where like 90 like 90 percent of the slaves that were brought to the united states come from those six groups and in that lesson i i give the primary sources to back that up but um i just wanted to let y'all know that too as well all right but we're going to keep going on with this brief overview of the Mandate people. Okay, 
the Sonaki had established large settlements based on intensive agriculture by 1000 BCE. And see, this is where I was talking about the proto Sonaki and the proto, the proto Mandi. And I'm reading from uh, my source, but this is where I'm going to have to disagree. The 1000 BCE, that's based, that's not, that's based off of theory. That's a hypothesis. Um, according to timelines and stuff that we have, and like I, anybody who knows, I have a biblical worldview. Uh, that timeline doesn't line up. I gave you a more proper uh, timeline, which would have been closer to maybe like 200 BC, 300 BC. Uh, but anyways, maybe as early as like four or 500 BC, which emerged into chiefdoms um, by 600 BC. And remember, when they, these are not the actual, the Sonaki hadn't migrated yet. These are other Israelites who moved into the area before. But like I said, we're going to get, I'm going to show you that with sources coming up um, and with primary sources. The Sonaki had established large settlements based on intensive agriculture by 1000 BCE, which emerged into chiefdoms by 600 BCE. Wagadu emerged, and Wagadu is just, it's the actual name for Ghana. That's what they called it. The Arabs are the ones who called it Ghana. Wagadu emerged as the most important of these and established control over the region between Dahar Tishiet and Mauritania to the south to the upper Senegal River. I mean, in Mauritania to the north, to the upper Senegal River in the south. Basing its capital at Al Gaba are the ruins at Kumbi Sela in southeastern Mauritania under the Sisse clan. Al Gaba, and then, yeah, we're going to get into that later, but it's in, based off of, you're going to see with the timeline, the Sisse clan couldn't have come till like circa 700 something eight. AD, and we have proof of that because the king, the line of kings that the Sonaki started, um, the Aibe Sisse did not start ruling to se till 750 AD. But like I said, this is why we have to start telling our own stories and piecing stuff together because this is stuff that Gentiles and Europeans are, they're doing the best that they can, but they're not the people. They're not from there. They're trying to piece stuff together. We have to put, the, put together the pieces for them and start telling our own history more accurately. Um, Al Gaba means forest in Arabic and refers to the sacred forest where the sacred python live. According to Arab geographers such as Al Bakari, writing in about, um, 1067 AD to 1068 AD, and that's that snake god I was telling you about. And like when, as we keep going forward in the lesson, when I bring out the sources that we're gonna read, you will see that it's impossible that this did not happen in BC times. This happened for the Sonaki. There were people living here and establishing and established uh, Ghana or Wagadu and these other cities were established. Um, Ghana didn't get established to like circa 200 AD. We'll cover that with the sources. But some of these other places got established in BC times, but that was by other Israelites who had migrated there and had already established those places. Um, but yeah, when we look into the, the Bita, the Sonaki or Mande snake god before they converted to Islam and the story behind that, it'll become abundantly clear that that was more around circa 700 AD. Um, anyways, though, but I, I, I just, that's interesting. That snake god. All right, let's move on. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay. And so before we go on with reading this, just to re-cover what I was just saying, um, the original Wagadu Hargana was founded by Israelite migrants who left Cyrene around circa 200 AD. And like I said, when we get to the primary sources dealing with this, it'll become abundantly clear um, that that's the case. So those earlier dates don't apply. Um, there was 22 kings that ruled up until there were 22 kings who ruled before the prophet Muhammad and the start of Islam. And then there was 22 more kings who ruled after that. Um, the last of those 22 kings was, was uh, Diabe Sisse. 
Okay, so 21 of them from the time of Muhammad up until Deabe Sise were uh, uh, unknown. Okay, then the other one, and then before that, same thing. The first king was Kwamayaga, and we'll cover that later. But then the other 21 were unknown. Like they don't have the names written down. Um, now, with this, with the weakening of Wagadu in the early 12th century, a number of small independent Soniki states emerged to the south of the old capital. Soso, ruled by the blacksmith Kante, Kante lineage, emerged as the most powerful. The Malayan epic of Sundiata portrays King Samoraro Kante as a cruel sorcerer. Sorcery has a common connection to blacksmiths who turn metal ore into tools and weapons. And an enemy of God, the epic of Sundiata Kiata, Sundiata Kiata has become the national epic of Mali, and it claims that the ruling family, the Kiate, descend from Balao, the Ethiopian companion of the prophet Muhammad. All right, around 1230, Sundiata was able to defeat Samararo and establish the kingdom of Mali. His general, Taramakin, Troy conquered much of West Africa to the Atlantic coast, beginning the widespread presence of Mande peoples. In general, Malayan rule took the form of vassalage, and the original ruling elite maintained local power but paid taxes and recognized the authority of the Malayan king. Thus, Sundiata took the title of Mansa, meaning king of kings, which his descendants continued to use. The Kiata rulers moved the capital from its original spot in Kangaba, Kaba, south to Bamako to Timbuktu on the Saharan side of the Niger River in order to better control the trans-Saharan trade. Mali remained rich and powerful into the 15th century when the Songhai king broke Mali's control and was able to take the province of Mimma. The Songhai were based in their capital, Goa, or Gayo, further east along the Niger River. And in 1469, their king, C, or Soni Ali, Beri, conquered Timbuktu. The kingdom of Mali broke up into numerous small states centered on major cities such as Segu and Noraro. The Mende of Sierra Leone were expelled from the kingdom of Mali sometime shortly before its fall and by 1540 had established an independent state in the Cape Mount area of present-day Liberia. Following the collapse of Mali in the 15th century, a number of states emerged and Mande often formed the ruling elite over other ethnic groups such as the Galwar rulers of the Serer kingdoms of of Sin and Salum in Senegal and Liberia, the Mende spread from their base around Cape Mount in the 17th century and came into conflict with the Timne and eventually gained control over much of what is today Sierra Leone. Mande or Mande controlled states in West Africa were slowly conquered by the British or the French starting in the second half of the 19th century. And so that's a brief overview of the Mande. And the source for all of this information is the first source on the reference page. Um, the Timne people that were mentioned, the Timne people are Israelites as well. They descend from Judah. You can even find Timne was one of the descendants of Judah. You can go look that up in the Bible on your own time. Um, Timne people were also brought to the New World as slaves. I focus mostly on dealing with um, the roots of the United States because that's where I live. Uh, some Timne were brought over here as well, but because of the, I lumped them in into the, the Mande grouping, even though they're not a Mande people, because when they were brought over here, they were under Mande influence. And so, um, they got lumped in with them anyway, because they were like the cultural similarities and things that were going on at the time, uh, would cause that. So you had, and the, the Timne, uh, uh, a state that they went to here a lot was South Carolina. Um, yeah, I'm just giving you more information, learning something, on, learning stuff on your way to learning stuff. Okay, but maybe I'll do a lesson at some point in the later, way later future on the Timney. Uh, 
Uh, probably not, because there's somebody I found some stuff online where some other people have done some very, very thorough research on that subject. And so I probably won't. If anybody ever had any questions and wanted to learn more about that, I'll just put you in contact with the information that you need from other people who have done very thorough research on the um, Timne people. OK, um, I have some Timne ancestry because some of the slaves on the plantation in South Carolina where my ancestors came from or, and then migrated to Mississippi later um, were Timne. Like I've told you before on this, my direct paternal line is a con. But they also on the plantation, they had a con slaves were purchased and Mandinka or men. I'm not going to say Mandinka. Mandate slaves were also purchased and um, Timne. So at some point, you know, with marrying and intermingling, there's going to be some of that in there as well. So, um, like I said, just learning something on your way to learning something and extra information. All right, let's keep moving forward and dive on in. Uh, establishing Ghana or Wagadu. So now that we've gotten a brief overview, let's now let's get into the meat and potatoes of this thing. After suffering defeat in the Kittos War, um, 117 AD, and the Bar Kaaba Revolt, 135 AD, large groups of Israelites began leaving Mediterranean North Africa and settled around the Niger River area. And I have their highlighted previous lessons. Um, I did a lesson called uh, Israelite Migrations, Israelite Migration to West Africa, circa, I think like 117 AD or something. And um, it's dealing with the Kittos War refugees. Um, I'm going to link that video to the end of this lesson. That'll explain in more detail about this. Uh, that's not the point. Of, that's not the main point of this lesson. And we still got a lot more to cover. So we're going to keep it pushing. But if you want to learn more about that, you can check out that lesson with the sources and everything for that. But we're going to get a source here, too, for it. Um, based on sources we have. They established the Kingdom of Ghana circa 200 AD. This is a rough estimate based on Tariq al-Sudan and Tariq al-Fatash, which, and those are, um, I'll just cover them now. I was going to tell you what they were in the reference section um, as part of the key readings, like other stuff you can read other than the sources that I have, but um, Tariq al-Fatash is a West African chronicle written in Arabic in the second half at the 17th century, it provides an account of the Songhai Empire um, from the reign of Sonia Ali up to 1599 with a few references of events in the following century. It also covers the background of um, Ghana and Mali um, and before it goes into Songhai, and that's how we get this information. And then Tariq El Sudan, um, or the history of Sudan, is a West African chronicle written in Arabic around 1655 by Abid al-Sadi, excuse me, it provides the single most important primary source for the history of the Sungai Empire. And that was actually written, um, let me see, which one was it that was written by the Sunaiki? We're going to get, we're actually going to read from this because I have this one as one of my sources. The other one, the Tariq al-Fatash, was actually written by a Sunaiki, a Sunaiki. So, Anyways, just more learning something on your way to learning something. The and anyways, and these would be these would be considered primary sources, uh, not for the 200 A.D. obviously, but for dealing with like Mali and Songhai and, and later the latter end of Ghana, it the Ghana Empire. It would be considered a primary source. This is a rough estimate based on Tariq El Sudan and Tariq El Fatash, which stated. There were 22 kings, and I have in parentheses there, 21 unknown, who ruled before the Muslim prophet Muhammad, and 22 um, after. The first king was Kwayamaga. His line ended circa 750 AD, and that's, you know, a rough estimate. I've already explained to you before, circa, and what we end up doing. We end up having to split the baby. Um, when Diabe Sisse and the Sonike clan of, Mon of Mande began to rule. The Mande, having left the kingdom of Judah circa 700 BC, first settled in Kemet and then Moreau, um, you know, or Kush slash Nubia, before migrating to Ghana. Um, I wanted to address, there's another scholar, she brings up a lot of good information, 
But there is a her timeline because she says Diabe Sise uh, migrated like around this time, around 200 and something AD. But it doesn't line up with the it doesn't line up with the records. And there was something else where I can't find any sources where she talks about them being a general of the Nubian army or the Moro army. And I, I can't find anything that can to that backs that up. So uh, that's just another side note. The how we come up to 200 AD is OK. So the, the Prophet Muhammad was born around 570 AD, somewhere around there died like 630 AD. So let's just say 600 AD. OK, let's just, you know, split the baby, say 600 AD. If there was 22 kings before 600 AD, let's just assume doing an es during an estimate that those 22 kings reigned for 20 years on average. In reality, because even if you use the Bible as a model for kings, if you look at the kings of Judah and the kings of the northern kingdom, it's like some kings ran. And this is all throughout with any culture and society. Some kings may rule for 40 years. Some kings may rule for 20. Some kings only ruled for like a year or less than a year because they got killed in the kingship and overthrown and then somebody else takes it over. So usually in a lot of historians, what they'll do is they'll just average. If you don't know, you average it out to 20. Gives you a, if you see where I'm going with this, like that's the average you get because it's a median because half of the, of the kings probably ruled longer than 20 years and the other half, probably ruled less than 20 years. So as I like to always say, you split the baby, which is also a biblical reference from King Solomon. But, you know, you can look that up on your own time. <laughs> we split the baby and we go 20 years. Based off of that, we say about circa 200 AD. Um, and that's why I said it's a rough, it, that's a rough estimate. Um, that would have been about the time that the empire of Ghana was founded by this uh, how do I pronounce this? Koyamaga. But now we're going to look at the sources. So this is this the source we're about to read from. And if you're asking yourself from the last slide, how do you end up with 200 AD um, from the time of the prophet Muhammad based off of 22, like that there was 22 kings before Muhammad but then there's 22 kings after and you end up and somehow um, you're saying Diabe Sisse ruled around circa 750 AD, maybe like 800 AD. And you're saying, well, that's only like a 150, 200 year difference. And then how do you get that 400 year difference before? We have more information. Uh, we know when Diabe Sisse around roughly when he started ruling. And so we're going with the record that's given to us, which says there was 22 kings before and 22 kings after. And so I don't know what happened between, uh, you know, between 600 and like 600 AD and 800 AD, why there was so much rapid uh, ascension of kings. Um, I mean, I can speculate the speculation that I would make, which is highly plausible. Um, the Soniki kings replace the line that was already in place so and i already discussed about how the akan the timne other groups that started my, that were also israelites have started migrating to ghana and settling so that would cause displacement a lot of um you know strains on the economy different things like that it was a chaotic time that's probably why you had a lot of kings falling out quickly okay anyways just let that mull around in the in the old noggin. But um, this is the source we're about to read from. And so we're going to move on to the next slide now and start reading from the source. All right. So the part in quotations is um, a quote from the source. The things in red is my commentary that we're going to discuss after. Um, also, another key person to read for further readings. This guy, Maurice Delafosse, was a French dude who did a lot of research in West Africa. And that's a that's a thing. Like a lot of the research on this stuff is in French um, in Arabic. So like to get a lot of the detailed information, you got to know French or Arabic. 
that's another reason why there's a lot of confusion on this uh, stuff as well, because you have American scholars who have only studied uh, what's available in English. And if you want more detailed information, you're going to have to study the French and the Arabic. But anyways, Maurice Delafosse wrote a lot of books dealing with this stuff. You should check them out if you know French. Maurice Delafosse postulated a migration of the so-called Judeo-Syrians who wandered from Libya to Bornu. And let's break this down piece by piece, because this was the main source I wanted to use for this part. All right, so Judeo-Syrians, that's what I've been talking about before, Hebraic, Syro-Phoenicians. These are Israelites and Canaanites, um, Aramians. But in this case, when we're talking about um, Ghana and the actual establishing of Ghana, it was established by Israelites specifically, um, who wandered from Libya toward, to Bornu. And I have Bornu highlighted for a reason. Um, and then westwards across the savannah, to these white migrants, whom he regarded also as the answers, ancestors of the Fulani, or Fuble, and we're going to touch on that, Delafase ascribed the creation of at least two kingdoms, Ghana and Takria. So we're seeing here that from, and when he says he ascribed this, he was there in West, he was there in West Africa in the early 1900s, like recording this stuff. So this is pretty reliable. And saying that what we covered in the last slide, the first king, Kwameaga, and when the first people to come and establish Ghana around circa 200 AD, roughly around that time period, those were Israelites or Judeo-Syrians who migrated there. Okay. Uh, as we discussed before, you had a lot of people migrating from Cyrene and going to the Niger River area around that time after the Jewish-Roman Wars or the Roman-Jewish Wars, specifically the Kittos. Um, affair and the Bar Kaaba revolt, excuse me, uh, and Cyrene is in Libya, okay, the, and the reason here why uh, this guy and this source that I'm using says white migrants, this goes back to, like I said, we have to start telling our own, our own stories, this guy is going off of his mindset of, and I think the guy who wrote this is an Edomite, uh, you know, an Edomite Jew, or one of the ones who call themselves Jews, but are not they, uh, the guy who wrote this book, not more, not Maurice Delafosse, who he's quoting, but the one who wrote this book. Uh, they're coming from the standpoint of like, oh, the Jews are white. So if Jews came, it must be white migrants. Uh, another thing, they misinterpret some terms that are used in West Africa and that are used by um, Arabs in West Africa to refer to people who migrated, um, who were not like the original Hamitic people that were living there. Um, and that's all like to refer to Semitic people who came. It doesn't mean that their skin was white. Okay. Cause we know what color the Israelites were. I have a lesson dealing with that and that completely proves that. And it, anyways, just common sense. If you've been following me, you know what color the Israelites were. It says white migrants because he's referring to Jews and he's thinking of in the context of what we think today, uh, the Jews you see on TV and everything that are running everything in the world are white Jews, um, the ones who claim to be the real ones. You know, I'm not going to go into details with that because I don't want to open up the door at all to any type of uh, hate speech and stuff coming onto my page and people saying stuff. So we're just going to leave that there. Um, what else did I want to touch on with this before I get to before I get to my commentary? Uh, all right, we'll just keep it. We'll just keep it pushing. But that should be self-explanatory. It's just letting you know that Ghana was established by Judeo Syrian or Israelite migrants from Libya. Because it just says that who wandered from Libya to Ghana. OK. So I wanted to bring out that source. There's the source for that. Now let's get into some commentary. Um, they did not, it's supposed to be, they did not stay in Bornu, the Lake Chad area, because the area was overcrowded and not favorable at the time. The lesson I did on the Akan, um, Yoruba, and Igbo Israelite origins, and I talk about their migration, I think, no, 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 not that one. The biblical origins of the Bantu and the Niger-Congo groups. 
I covered this thoroughly. Um, you had a lot of people living near the Lake Chad area um, at that time and in BC times. And the Lake Chad was larger than what it is now, uh, extremely a lot larger. Uh, and you just had too many people migrating there. And that correlates to what's called the Bantu migrations. Um, for the sake of this lesson, I'm not going to go into too much detail. But if you want more on that, like why they did not stay in the Lake Chad area when they got there, I'm going to link the lesson I did on the biblical origins of the Bantu. And I thoroughly explain um, why that was the case, because that area had already been established by some Hamitic groups. And later you had Israelites and other Hebrews and uh, Assyrians and Canaan, like I covered that in that lesson and they migrated there and it just became too overpopulated and people had to leave. Um, and plus there were some other issues going on. Next, the Fulani. This, the Fulani descend from the ancient Libyan. And I've been holding off on bringing out the um, the background on the Fulani. Uh, this is from my thorough research and I'll admit this is my, this is my hypothesis. Nobody knows where the Fulani came from. People in Africa don't even know where they came from. And the Fulani themselves have their own theories, like every, and there's all kinds of out the way stuff. I've done thorough research on this, and I'm not the only one who says this. There's a lot of scholars who also say this. Um, they come from the ancient Libyans, or Ham's son Put. Um, those were the people originally living in Libya. They speak a Niger Congo language because they have lived amongst Hebraic Syro Phoenicians, and I have in parentheses the true Niger Congo Atlantic slash Bantu. And let me uh, settlers in sub Saharan Africa for thousands of years, and let me touch on these things. There's some stuff we got to touch on. Um, this Niger Congo group, I want to bring this out because I have people always like they getting confused because I like to use the term Bantu to refer to the whole group. But Bantu really specifically refers to the, the people living in like southern Africa. The Bantus refer to the Niger Congo group in southern Africa and eastern Africa. Niger Congo group A are the ones in the Atlant that live in western Africa in the Atlantic region. Okay. Um, and they're called the language family and the group is called Niger Congo. Okay. And you have two branches. You have the Atlantic branch and the Bantu branch. Okay. When uh, with the migrations, the Atlantic branch obviously went to West Africa. The Bantu branch went into other parts of Southern, Central and Eastern Africa. Um, hold on, because there's a lot of stuff here that we need to cover. That I want to make sure we get. Do, do, do. All right. Oh, and I'll just explain that part too. the ancient Libyans. And I've covered this a lot of times. You have the ancient Libyans are put living there first. Then Josephus tells us and other historical records tell us that Abraham son, one of Abraham's sons, Midian, who had another son named Ephor. Abraham placed Ephor in northwest Africa where the Libyans were and supplanted them. OK, and became a, and established his own kingdom there. That's where we get the word Afri, uh, Africa from. I've covered this a lot of times. A whole lot of times, and I'm not about to go into it now, um, and because that's not the point of this lesson. But there are sources for that, because um, I always harp on the fact that we got to stop saying that Africa was named after Scipio Africanus, because it was not. That's just something that irks me. Like as a historian, it just irks me because it's not factual. Um, Scipio Africanus got the name Africanus because of his exploits in the war with Carthage, in the Punic Wars. Okay, so then after Ephraim's son comes, and you have those, those Afri, the descendants of Ephraim's Afri people still exist today. They're a branch of um, so-called Berbers, but they look, uh, they're like very dark-skinned, but that's not the point of this. So then um, after they went there, then you have the Punic people come, which was Canaanites and Israelites, our Phoenicians and Israelites who settled in Carthage and other places around the Mediterranean part of North Africa. And so then they came and further pushed people out. So through that process, the ancient Libyans started moving further and further south, okay, 
till they got to the Lake Chad area and other parts of um and other parts of the Sahelian region and started establishing themselves. Um all right, back to my commentary. They we were at the part where they were living in ancient Egypt, having immigrated there after Jacob and the twelve tribes. So the group of Fulani who descend from the ancient Libyans, they went into they migrated into Egypt as well, probably for the same reasons that Jacob and the twelve tribes did, or his twelve sons did originally, because there was famine going on throughout the world and an economic um, depression was going on at that time. This is recorded in the Bible as well. So that's why they went into Egypt. That's probably why this branch of Libyans went into Egypt as well. Okay. And anybody who knows the Fulani, they're pastoral. They herd cattle. Um, all right. They were a cast of cattle herders. And um, the Bible tells us and other records tells us that the Egyptians looked down on people who herd, herded cattle. And that was something at the time the Israelites were pastoral. Um, the Israelites eventually became sedentary. That's marked in the Bible. Uh, but when they went into Egypt, they were pastoral as well. Uh, all right, back to, these Fulani, to the Fulani. They assisted the Israelites during the Exodus and were banished from Egypt, thus settling in Sahelian regions and from there, West and Central Africa. Um, so that's basically your background on the Fulani. And we're going to read a source on that coming up but um that's their descent people have been asking that and wondering um and i've been saying before the fulani like the fulani are not israelites like they're not they and they were heavily involved in the slave trade and selling and in jihads and establishing islam throughout west africa like brutally um with the language, the reason the reason why their language is a member of the Niger Congo family instead of being a part of the Nilo Saharan family, like the Sunghai um, and the Kunari and stuff, which we're I'm gonna touch on Sunghai later in the lesson, is because the Fulani have been living amongst uh, the Niger Congo peoples are the Niger Congo branch A peoples for thousands of years. And because of that, that's why their they their language has now become a part of our branch. All right. Okay. And here is a source for what I was just telling you about with the Fulani. Um, you can read the source. I'm gonna leave it up for a second um, because we're not dealing with the Fulani in this lesson, and they're not the they're not the point of this lesson. I'm gonna move on. But I'm just leaving this up there for a second. And, you know, for anybody who's interested in that, they can jot this information down. Okay, so next we're going to read from the Tariq al Sudan. Um, there's the reference for it. Leave it, this up also for a second. Um, I would encourage people to like share this information with people. Share it with share it with people who are trying to learn about our history. Because another reason that inspires me to do this is all my life I've met uh, people here in America, like so-called African Americans, who will be like, "Man, I wonder what our history was before slavery." Or I wonder, do we have an ancient history? And it's like, yeah, you do. And then I, I've even met uh, people of other nationalities who will ask me and are access like, what was y'all's history before slavery? What was your religion before before slavery? What was y'all doing in ancient times? And like, you know, basically like we don't have no history. No, we have a, a rich and glorious history, just like everybody else on the planet. Um you know, it just needs to be brought out. So share this information with, with people. Okay, so here from um, the Tariq al Sudan, we're going to establish that um, we are going to establish that. Wait, which one is this? Are we doing Tariq al Fatash? I don't even remember from my own slide. Anyways, you remember from the last previous slide, the source. Um, the this is going to show that there were 22 kings before Muhammad and then afterwards 
And this is a primary source, not for, you know, circa 200 AD, but recording this. This is the primary source because it's from the 16th century. Observation. Mali is a very large and extensive region in the far west, extending toward the Atlantic Ocean. The first ruler to establish a state there was Kwayamaga, the seat of his sovereignty being Ghana, a large city in the land of Bagana. It is said that the state was founded before the Prophet Muhammad's mission and that the 22 kings ruled before that event and 22 after, making a total of 44 in all. Okay, and that they were Badan in origin means that they came from the uh, Middle East. And we already established that they came from Cyrene, which was in Libya, and that they were leaving the Mediterranean region because of the Roman Jewish wars where they had just suffered defeat. And they were trying to escape Roman influence. And so they migrated to Niger, to the Niger River area first. And then went a little further west and near Lake Chad and went a little further west and established Ghana. But this is just another source, um, another source to back up what I was saying. And sorry for the markings. This is from an actual book where I, I, I made markings in it. All right, and we're jumping back and forth. So we're going back to this source. Okay, now we're about to start reading from this source again. All right, everywhere clans claiming Sonaki origin share the pride of having been once the people of the ancient Sonaki kingdom of Wagadu, which is Ghana. The legends about Wagadu are still functional in explaining the origins of different Sonaki clans and groups. The status of the Sonaki clan and its place in the parallel hierarchical structure of other peoples is often explained in terms of the role their ancestor had played in ancient Wagadu, or in the way this ancestor was affiliated to Dinga, the legendary ancestor of the Sonaki. There are different versions of the legend of Wagadu, but only one thing. Theme. The story runs thus. Dinga came from the Orient and stayed in Jenna for some time. And we've covered this. The Orient meaning they came from the kingdom of Judah. They came from Israel. They were Israelites. They migrated into Egypt or Kemet. And from there they went into Nubia, Nubia or Cush Moro as we covered. And from there uh, Dinga migrated to our person, this person named Dinga, migrated over to West Africa, um, basically migrating to West Africa from East Africa or Northeast Africa. Um, and the Orient for people, that just means East. That's all that that means. Um, yeah, I guess that that's all we need to cover with that. Um, where are we at? The story runs thus. Dinga came from the Orient and stayed in Jenna for some time. He then moved to Daira Badia in Massinia, in Massina, where he married. One of his wives' sons was the ancestor of the Sanaki in Daifinio in the Sahel near the Columbine River. Another son, Fade Ahaji Suwari, was the founder of Diaka Sir Bafing, which developed as the center of the Diakani. From the Dia Dinga, from Dia Dinga moved to Kingu and reached a place southwest of Niaro, which had been dominated by goblins. There followed a magician's duel from which Dinga emerged victorious and married the three daughters of the goblin. Um, this goblin thing, just really quick, uh, all throughout history, all cultures have this, uh, Europeans, Asia, blah, blah, blah. It was like in the forest, they have these legends of like elves or leprechauns or evil spirits and, um, you know, short mystical people. Uh, for all intents and purposes, Ding with this goblin, Dinga was probably uh, it was probably a pygmy in the forest because you had a, you still have pygmies living in the forest in this region. Um, now, when you, the pygmies got pushed further and further as you know, south into Africa and into more hiding places as the Bantus and the, as the Bantu branch of the Niger-Congo started settling, 
And as the Atlantic branch started settling in the sub-Saharan Africa, they got pushed out. So it was probably just a pygmy. But, um, you know, anyways, because you can't produce uh, you can't produce a child with a goblin. <laughs> anyways, so but another term for goblins like elf and elves are usually little. And this is from a European translating this. So it's probably a pygmy. Uh, you know, whatever. That's neither here nor there. We're just reading the story as it was as it's dictated from the people themselves. There followed a magician's duel from which Dinga emerged victorious and married the three daughters of the goblin. Dinga's sons from these wives were the ancestors of many Soniki clans. Among them was the Sise clan, the royal clan of Wagadu. Before his death, Dinga wanted to bequeath his power to his elder son, Kain. Oh, another thing. Remember, Dinga is coming. Dinga comes. He has his son, Diaba Sise, who becomes the first Soniki king of Ghana which is around like 750 AD or 800, you know, AD around that time. Uh, so these women that Dinga were marrying were the women who were already living there. And we've already established that Ghana had already been established by Israelites. So you have Dinga, who's an Israelite, marrying other women who are who are already living there, who are also Israelites. OK. Uh, do, do, do. Dingas, we read that part. Bequeathed power to his elder son, Kind. But as in the story of Jacob and Esau, a younger son, Daiba, Daibe, outwitted Keen and obtained his father's blessing and power. Following Dinga's death, Daibe had to flee from his brother's rage. He found refuge in the bush when one day a mysterious drum fell down from a tree before his feet. At the sound of the drum, four troops of cavalry came out from the four corners of the bush. The four commanders recognized Diabe as their superior. They became his lieutenants, and later, after the foundation of the kingdom, they became chiefs of the four provinces. All right, I'm enjoying doing this lesson. It is uh, it's enjoyable. I like bringing out this type of information um especially like these this ancient history and stuff and, and as like i've said before we really need to start as a people start making movies about this stuff and you know stop letting ourselves get screwed with movies like black panther or back in the day like lion king which essentially is just based off of sun Diada's epic and i remember growing up here in america when i was like disney kept releasing cartoon movies where it was like every ethnic, every major ethnic group in America was getting a movie like Pocahontas for the Native Americans, Mulan for the Asians. Uh, and then for us, they came out with Lion King or as animals. And it was like based off of a real story. They say it's based off of Hamlet, but that is based off of the epic of Sun Diata. Uh We need to start making movies and telling these epic stories about our history. All right. Anyways, that's a digression. Daebe, at the head of his new army, set out to establish a kingdom. He was directed to Kumbi between Gumbe and Nima. The place was guarded by Bita, a black snake. This is that snake god I was telling you about that they still kept practicing that that was their god before they converted to Islam. Remember, we covered that earlier in the lesson. And that was the thing their ancestors were worshiping back in Israel in the kingdom of Judah during the reign of Hezekiah. All right. Anyways, who gave Diabe permission to settle there on condition that he would be given the most beautiful young version every year. So we're talking about human sacrifice. And remember, the Israelites also in the Bible engaged in human sacrifice. They used to sacrifice their children to the, I think it was the Moabite god Molech. I know it's the god Molech, but I I don't think Molech was Canaanite. I think it was Moabite and Ammonite. They used to sacrifice them too. But anyway, these are all just learning stuff on your way to learning stuff. You can read about that in the Bible. I strongly encourage people to read the Bible. Even the people who think like, oh, the Bible, I don't want to read that. Like you've never really read the Bible. Uh, just read the whole thing, like from beginning to end, even if you don't believe in it, just for fun, just read it. It's a very interesting read. Also, specifically to the black man in America, the Israelite. 
start from the Old Testament and read, bro. Because if you read from the Old Testament, you probably will get more involved and want to come on board with following what the Bible teaches. Start with that first. Well, you should anyway, because you got to read it from beginning to end. But read it, because what you'll find out is a lot of these stories that I'm telling you about, like ancient Africa and their history and the stories of their ancestors, they're pretty much the same thing you're going to read in the Old Testament, like the same type of you can see parallels like where it's like Old Testament Israelite culture is very similar to West African Israelite culture, <laughs> Israelite culture and stuff going on, you know, thousand years after the Old Testament. Similar type stories. Anyways, um, in return, Vita promised abundant rain and gold. The new kingdom of Wagadu, with its capital at Kumbi, prospered under the rule of Daabe Sise and his descendants, who were given the title Manga or Maga. The kingdom was divided into four provinces, each headed by one of the four commanders. The descendants of Dinga and the four Fado are recognized as the aristocratic clans of the Suniki or the Wago. The Wago who gave their name to Wagadu are clearly associated with the history of that ancient kingdom of the Sonaki. Once a year, representatives of the four princes of Wagadu assembled at Kumbi to celebrate the sacrifice of the virgin Bita. This ceremony ensured the, the continuation of rain and gold and may also have promoted cohesion of the kingdom. Some versions of the tale say that each year another province each year, another province in its turn had to offer the virgin for Beda. During the reign of the seventh king of Wagadu, when the virgin was brought forth to Beda's cave, her brave suitor killed the snake. The dying snake pronounced a dreadful curse which caused the des desiccation of the land and the secession of the gold. The head of the slaughtered snake fell down in Buri in the country of the Malinke, which then became the land of gold. That's the um, the Mali Empire would rise up after that. That's where you the Mandinka people started um, ruling the kingdom. Okay, another branch of the Mande people. Okay, and remember their kingship comes from Balau, uh, the Ethiopian Jew who was a who was a contemporary of the Prophet Muhammad um, in Islam which then became the land of gold. Deprived of rain and gold, Wagadu was ruined. Its Sonaki people dispersed and their country turned to desert. And this is from pages 16 through 18 of that book. Uh, also another contributing factor to the fall of Ghana. So you had the famine and drought, but then there was also the Moors kept attacking them. The Almoravides attacked them. And that was a major um, cause for the fall of Ghana as well. Okay, next we're bringing out this source. Uh, and this is just to show you about the type of religion that the Israelites practice in West Africa um, and other Niger-Congo groups like that descend from the Canaanites. Uh, so basically like the ones who descend from the Israelites, the Canaanites, uh, the Hebraic Syrophoenician peoples that... Um, settled in sub-Saharan Africa. This is the origins of their religion. I've been saying this in a lot of lessons and I haven't brought out this source, but um, I'm gonna bring out this source that shows you it was a blending of traditional Jewish religion and ancient Babylonian Canaanite religion. Um, we're gonna read from a primary source proving that, okay? And you can jot this down if you want. It will also be on the reference page at the end. All right. Now, remember what we're about to read. This is a primary source, firsthand account from the 1700s. And we're looking at the part where I have marked because this came from an actual book, too, as well. But even so, on account of the blacks, carelessness and negligence in all religious affairs, their religion remains so murky and unrecognizable that you could live among them for many years without noticing that in the form that the Negroes' forefathers have practiced it, it has in it something of Judaism, um, yeah, as well as the old Chaldean fire worship. Our Acheras, more than any other nation, and the Acheras, those are, those descend from the Ga people in Ghana and modern day country of Ghana, they're Israelites as well, 
They live near the Akan people. Uh, just they're not their numbers are just not as large. This would include the Akan people, too, because I think by the 1700s, the Akan people have become dominant in the area of Accra. Uh, anyways, our Akras, more than any other nation, are close to Judaism in their ceremonies of circumcision and those in relation to the slaughter of sacrifices when they must saw away at the throat of a cow, sheep, or other creature with a sharp stone and never use a knife since that would desecrate the sacrifice. At Benin, both of these religions are very recognizable. So he's letting you know, and Benin was further away. I've covered that before. Uh, it's in Nigeria. That's where the Edo were. And he's also saying over there that was these same type of practices were noticed. Okay. Um, and I've done lots of lessons on the Edo before and their background. The Edo um, do not descend from an Israelite background. Um, I've covered that numerous times. But you're going to have similarities because, as I've said before, they were Hebraic Syrophoenician migrants. OK, so there was other groups besides Israelites who migrated as well, but they all have similar cultures. And this is documented in the Bible and this is documented all throughout history. Uh, so hopefully I don't get any weirdo comments from Edo people because. I constantly get those. They've kind of fallen off because I did um, a specific short, like 10 minute lesson where I brought out a Nigerian scholar, um, a current Nigerian scholar, one of their lead historians. And he clearly said in the source that I brought out that in it, which I already know and history backs this up, that the Edo were not sold as slaves. Like very few of them were. That wasn't, they were the ones selling people as slaves. They weren't, so they don't fit the curses is the thing. They don't fit the curses of Deuteronomy 28. They don't fit the signs of the Bible that line up with um, who the Israelites are to let you know who the Israelites are. Also, um, their history, like I covered that too. They were, anyway, I'm not going to get into that, but I've thoroughly covered that. But there are some similarities with their religion and also with Judaism, but not as much as like, with the Akan and the God people, um, the Edo were more doing like Canaanite, ancient Babylonian religion, sacrificing human beings. <laughs> like here we're talking with the, <laughs> we're talking about with the Akan and the God people sacrificing animals like the Levites did in the Old Testament. The Edo were sacrificing human beings. And I have some newspaper clippings that I haven't brought out as a source, but the British like I have clippings that are from the 1880s and 1890s, newspaper clippings, like from London and New York City, where they're talking about the British observing human sacrifices happening. Um, and that was part of the reason why the British had to come in and take over Benin or the Edo region, because they wanted to one in slavery, because even up until like the late 1800s and the 1890s, the Edo were still enslaving Israelites and selling them off. And they were still practicing human sacrifice. All right. In this slide, we have a few things to cover. But back to the story at hand. Dinga migrated to Ghana around the same time as Bilal's sons. Bilal's sons also leaving from Nubia. And I have the, the source for that. You can check that on the reference page. Once there, both married women from the already established Israelite population. The empire of Mali arose out of the ashes of Ghana. Mali was eventually taken over by Sunghai. Okay, and so uh, Sunghai people are not related to the mandate, but we have to, I'm going to cover them for a brief second and to clear something up and just also more learning something on your way to learning something. Excuse me. Um, in Babylon, the Timbuktu, which is a book a lot of Israelites here read and use as their way, like it's the gateway book to you coming into the truth. Uh, and that book was written a while ago. Uh, there is one error in that book. In the book, it states that um, the empire of Ghana was founded by the Za dynasty, who were a group of Jews from Yemen. The Za dynasty was not, has nothing to do with Ghana. The Za dynasty founded Gayo, which was a separate city 
that was controlled by the Songhai, not not related to Ghana and the Mande people and any of that. And the Songhai people are not Israelites. They come from they're a Nilo Saharan family. That's the same family in which means um, well, I'll cover that when we get to the point of the African languages. But another thing, too, that was mentioned in there, the timetable that saying it was like a, a Yemenite king who was a Jew that we've I've discussed that a lot on here before. People don't have knowledge of the Himyarite kingdom and that they were Arabs who converted to Jews in Yemen prior to Islam. And I've dealt with that a lot on these in, in the lessons that I've dealt with. But in the case of the Zah dynasty, they didn't. It's not really possible for them to have even come from that time period. The Zah dynasty came, the, the people, the two dudes from era, uh, from Yemen, and we're going to get the primary source of this, that came over and, and became kings over uh, the Songhai people, they came after uh, Muhammad or after the Islam period, and they were already Muslims more than likely. And I say more than likely, we'll see on the next, when I get to the slides, you'll see with the math how that breaks down. It's highly improbable that they came from during the Himyarite time. It would have been like after the time of uh, Muhammad. But this part in red, this is some commentary of mine I wanted to discuss. Songhai peoples are made up of four groupings, with one being of Berber background. They are Nilo-Saharan people slash speakers. Their language is an isolate in the family. This is because they descend from Philistines chased into Northwest Africa by the Israelite King David's general, Joab. And I have the source there, number six. That's on the reference page. When we get to the reference page, I actually have the quote there. So we'll read it. So you uh, explaining how Joab, David's general, chased the Philistines into uh, Northwest Africa or modern day Morocco. OK, Genesis 10 uh, verses 13 through 14. You can look this up on your own in the Torah informs us that the Philistines are Hamitic descendants of Ham, of Ham's son Mizraim, which Mizraim in the Bible is Kemet or Egypt. There, so the Philistines came from one of the sons of Mizraim, so they descend from the ancient Egyptians. Their language is of Nihilitic origin, but they are in an area where the Saharan, which is the Libyan, so basically, let me, I wanted to break down some stuff with African languages. So with the Nilo-Saharan languages, you have Nihilitic languages in that branch, which are uh, mostly found like in Eastern Africa, but you do have some in Central Africa. They stretch now from like Sudan down to Uganda, but you also have them in Central Africa. And those are uh, people who descend from the ancient, ancient Egyptians, um, the original stock. And they're like the first group of the original black Egyptians to start leaving Kemet for various reasons. Uh, some of those reasons would be, you know, the uh, starting with the Assyrian assaults and later on, then you have like the Persians and the Greco-Romans. And so they started leaving early, like early on. And some of them might have even probably started leaving Kemet around like the the Hyksos area, Hyksos time even started migrating out. So a point I want to bring out with that is the reason. So the Coptic language or the Egyptian language, like from circa 600 BC on forward, gets lumped in in the Afro-Asiatic branch. The reason why it's lumped in in the Afro-Asiatic branch is because uh, of so much contact at that time and going forward with Semitic peoples and their language blending in. And so it gets lumped in, it gets lumped in now with the Afro-Asiatic languages. The language that the Nihilitic people speak is more, can is probably closer to what the actual ancient, ancient Egyptians spoke. Uh, Cause that's where they, that's where they descend from. Another thing you have to keep in mind though too, is Gentiles are the ones who put this stuff together. And they do the best that they can, but there is some stuff that they're off always in. So, like, for example, uh, like the uh, the Canaanite language is considered a Semitic language. Well, in re the Bible tells you the Canaanites were Hamites, so they don't descend from Shem. So it would be a, a Hamitic language. But because of so much in, in 
because of so much cultural interactions between the Israelites and the Canaanites, their language, um, they influenced each other. And so now that language gets lumped, that ancient language gets uh, lumped in as a Afroasiatic language. Well, in reality, the, the Israelites or the Hebrew language was way more influenced by the Canaanite language. And it's basically an offshoot of the Canaanite language. So the way they have it diagrammed is actually incorrect. Uh, a lot of these Semitic languages like Hebrew should be put under like a Hamitic branch. But excuse me, that's a digression. And I don't want to go too much with too much information because I don't want people to get, you know, I don't want to give you too many dots that you have to connect. But anyway, so you have that Nihilitic branch and the Nihilo-Saharans. And the Nilo-Saharan peoples. Then the Saharan branch, that comes from like the ancient Libyans and that group, groupings of peoples. And so that's where that language group comes from. The Songhai people live in an area where the only other Nilo-Saharan speakers are all from the Saharan branch. And But because their language descends actually from the ancient Egyptians via the Philistines, they and their language gets grouped as an isolate, like meaning we think it belongs in the Nilo Saharan, but we don't know. It might just be an isolate. It does belong in the Nilo Saharan. It's just more of a Nihilitic language than a Saharan language of the Nilo Saharan peoples. OK, that's just learning something on your way to learning something. Um, Where else do we want to cover to this? OK, prior to conversion to Islam, they worshiped the traditional the traditional Philistine supreme deity, Dagon, a fish god. So the Songhai people, before they converted to Islam, they were worshiping a fish god like their ancestors, the Philistines did before they got chased before that branch of Philistines that they descend from got chased into northwest Africa by Joab, the Israelite um, general of King David. And we're going to read this in the next, what a primary source. They worship, the, they come from the Philistines and they worship another, uh, they worship the same God that the Philistines worshiped in the Old Testament. They still were worshiping that up until their conversion to Islam. Um, next, a Muslim, and I, and I have slash monotheistic because you'll see on the next slide. I will concede there's a brief little possibility and it's very unlikely that um, they could have came, the the two brothers from Yemen could have came maybe between 570 and 600 AD. And so that's before Islam had started getting started. But we know monotheism had already spread, had started to spread through the Arabian Peninsula um, with uh, what's called Romanism or when the Himyarite kingdom had converted to Judaism before that. But by 570, that had been shut down. Um, I'm giving you a lot of information, but... Anyways, you'll see when we look at the math on the when we look at the math on the next slide where I made my markings on the page. Um, that's why I have the monotheistic there. But for the most part, more than likely, were they were they were Muslim already Muslim. Um, Yemeni Arab migrated to their area during the early Islamic period, uh, circa 650 A.D. He destroyed their idols and subsequently, over generations, his descendants converted them to Islam. He established the line of Songhai King. Okay, so, and we're going to read that from the source coming up. And something with the history, don't like, yeah, okay, in some cases an Arab did, it was an Arab who did come over and establish a line of kings. That did happen sometimes. If there's nothing like, oh, that can't be because you're trying to say we can't establish nothing ourselves. You were already there and already had stuff established. This is just somebody who came and, and established a line of kings. That happened with the Berbers in North Africa. You don't see them all up in arms about it. It's a, they have a Coke and a smile. Y'all need to have a Coke and a smile, too, when it comes to this kind of stuff. Another example of this happening was amongst the Kunari with the empire of Kanem Bornu. You had um, Yemen Arabs also coming there in the 11th century and establishing the uh, Sufawa dynasty. Um, but that's a lesson for a, another day. Well, actually, it's not a lesson for another day because I'm not going to do a lesson on Kanem Bornu. I only do lessons related to Israelite groups. Uh, you know, there because I have a, a, I'm trying to focus on them and the history of my people. So 
that's where I go. That's what I focus on. So there won't be a lesson on that. But I do touch on Kanem Bornu a lot in different lessons that I do. OK, so we're going back to this source um, to close out. And what we were talking about earlier too, the Kunari are also a Nilo-Saharan peoples. Just more information, learning on your way to learning. Now, like I said earlier, remember, this is a primary source. The ruler of Mali brought Songhai, Timbuktu, Diaka, Mima, and Bagana, and their neighboring territories under his sway to as far as the Salt Sea. The Malians enjoy tremendous power and extraordinary might. And the Salt Sea they're talking about is the Atlantic. The, that's where they got salt from. And the salt was um, a huge industry uh, in West Africa. So much so to the point that people would trade gold for salt. But anyway, now that doesn't, that's not ludicrous because they had so much gold. Like it wasn't to the point where it was almost worthless for some people. And a lot of that gold was coming from the forest areas where the Akan were. Anyways, their ruler had two principal commanders, one in charge of the South, who had the title of San Sankara Zuma, and one in charge of the North called Faran Sura. Each had a number of officers and troops under his command. This led to a tyranny. This led to tyranny, high handedness and the violation of people's rights in the latter days of their rule. So God Most High punished them by destroying them. One day in the early morning, an army of God Most High in the form of human children appeared before them in the Sultan's palace. These children attacked them with swords, killing almost all of them, and then disappeared in the space of a single hour by the power of the mighty and powerful one. No one knew where they came from or where they went to, but from that time onwards, the Malayans became weak and enfeebled. And this is why I said, like, a lot of the stuff of the stories uh, of our people uh, in West Africa is similar to our people in the Old Testament. And if you read the Old Testament, you'll see a lot of parallels. And the supernatural stuff, I don't put nothing past. I don't put nothing past anything. Because even in the Old Testament, when there was times um, God would send angels to fight battles for the Israelites, or have even in the Bible, he said he had turned to ain't have the angel fight against the Israelites. So if they if the Israelites didn't act right, so in this case, you know, if the Mandinka weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing, which it sounds like they weren't, um, you know, God probably punished them. Maybe he did send angels or whatever in the form of children to <laughs> a children army and destroyed them. I don't know. I wasn't there. This is just what's being, you know, marked down. And I'm sharing the information with you from the primary source. Uh, you can draw your own conclusions. But what we do know is that the, the empire of Mali did collapse at the hands of the Songhai. All right, let's keep reading. OK, now this is dealing with the Za dynasty that um, was that's mentioned in Timbuk in Babylon and Timbuktu, like I was saying, that was in a. In, incorrectly applied to the empire of Ghana when in reality it was the city of Gayo which later became the Songhai Empire okay so it lists the first kings I'm not going to read that part because I'm not interested in the group of the names of the kings although you will notice Zuwa Alaman meaning the guy from Yemen who came but we're going to get into that in the next uh, the next couple of slides from this uh, it says, though, the bottom paragraph is what we want to read. These 14 king, these 14 kings all died before the coming of Islam. And when they when it's saying the coming of Islam, it's talking about before the 14th, the 15th king converted to Islam. So it's not talking about 14 kings before Muhammad, like when we were when we were discussing um, the Ghana Empire. The 14 kings all died before the coming of Islam. None of them believed in God and his messenger. May God bless him and grant him peace. The first to convert to Islam was Zua Kusoy, called in their language Muslim Dam, meaning he became a Muslim of his own free will without compulsion. May God Most High have mercy on him. This took place in the year 400 of the Hijara, and then um, 
we can get it on the next page. Or I don't actually, I think I skipped that page. We don't need it. The point is, is 400 years after the Hajara, the Hajara is the Islamic form of keeping uh, recording time. Like we have AD and BC and they have their Hijara, and we know 400 years after from the Hajara is 1009 AD to our time. So 1009 AD. If you count 14 kings, and you can kind of see my math up there, if the kings ruled for 20 years uh, on average, and it was 14 kings, that would put the beginning of the first king being uh, 729 AD. If the if the average reign of the 14 kings was 30 years, it would put it at 589 A.D., a little bit before uh, the rise of Islam. And then lastly, I have 40 years with on average, which would put it at 449 A.D. Uh, and then that would place it in the Himyarite time um, of Yemen kings when they had converted to Judaism, those Arabs. But. Uh, that's highly unlikely that they have 14 kings ruling on average for 40 years. That's highly, highly unlikely. Uh, like I've discussed before, a better estimate would be to use 20 years on average, which would put it at around 729 A.D., um, you know, maybe 30. But, you know, I'm not here to figure that out. You can, you know, draw your own conclusions on the math. I'm just putting the information there for you. Moving on to the next pages, uh, the part we only concerned with for here is at the bottom, and I had to do this because I had to. The other sources I used, I had, I, I was able to get electronic copies so I could copy and paste into my into Google Slides the um, quotes I wanted to use, but for this I couldn't because it's not online. This is the primary source from like you know the 16th century, so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, like anyway, so the, we're only concerned with this bottom part. Then we're going to go into the next page of um, the document. As for the first king, Zuwa Alaman, the origin of the term is Jaman al Yaman, which means he came from the Yemen. It is said that he and his brother left the Yemen, roaming over the earth of God Most High. Okay, continuing to read until fate brought them to the town of Kuiki on the bank of the river in the land of Songhai. Kukia is very ancient, having existed since the days of Pharaoh. Indeed, it is said that it was from there that he assembled the sorcerers for the trial of strength with him to whom God spoke upon him be peace. They reached Kukikia in a dreadful state, hardly recognizable as human beings, blistered, dirty, and naked, save for some tattered skins covering their bodies. They stayed with the folk of that town who asked them where they had come from. The elder of the two said, Jamin al Yaman. So the people took to calling him Zuwa Alaman, authoring the name because their dull, non Arab tongues found it difficult to pronounce. And I just want to bring out that's what happens with transliteration. These people who are like, Oh, man, it's a conspiracy, man. There's no letter J. There was no letter J, so you can't say Jesus. It's got to be, and it's been corrupted. Dude, that just shows that you don't understand how languages get translated. You don't understand transliteration, and you think you sound smart, but in reality, you sound real dumb. I'm just going to point it out, man. I'm bringing it out. You're going to sound real, real dumb. There are certain things that, there are certain Different cultures are able to pronounce things in their language. And then when that word gets brought over to another language and they're not used to pronouncing it, they have to transliterate it. OK. And anyways, that's just learning something on your way to learning something. All right. He dwelt and I only bring that up because it's a lot of brothers who they watch YouTube stuff and conspiracy stuff and think that they got some secret knowledge you know like i said early earlier i call it the third eye i think me and my wife call them third eye documentaries uh -huh. <laughs> like you think you learn something and you go out spewing it and it's like you just proven you don't you don't know much and the people who think that you know much is because they don't know anything either and you're never in a circle around learn it actual learn it people who will check you on your nonsense um uh, anyways 
where are we at? He dwelt with them and found them to be pagans who worship nothing more than an idol. Now, remember, these are the Sunghai people, as I was telling you before, who and they descend from the Philistines. And so you have this Arab Yemeni person coming to them who migrated there. All right. The devil would appear to them at certain times on the surface of the river in the form of a fish with a ring in its nose. This is that Dagon. Go look it up. It's in the Bible, too. But you could just that was the Philistine God, their fish God. His name is Dagon. And they would gather around it and worship it. The fish would issue commands. And they were worshiping Dagon. Anyway, the fish would issue commands and prohibitions. And this, sorry, another side. This is why I say for our people, read the Bible, man. Even the one, even all, all of us, all Africans, read it and learn. Because it's like, even if you're not an Israelite, there's stuff in the Bible that applies to you historically. And also the Bible has the key to salvation for you making eternal life. That seems like a pretty important thing. I would look into it anyways. Um, and it's why I get into the stuff, too, that I don't understand why some groups get mad that they're not Israelites when it's like you have your own rich history, which in, in some of y'all's history is greater than the Israelites history, because our history is filled with slavery and screw ups where God has to whoop on us. OK, I don't you know. Anyways. That's just my side rant for a second. All right. The fish would issue commands and prohibitions and people would disperse and ex execute its commands, avoiding what it had prohibited them. On such occasions, Zua Alaman would be present. Now, when he realized that these folks were in manifest error, he secretly made up his mind to kill the fish and set his heart upon so doing. God aided him in this. And on the day of the fish's appearance, he threw an iron harpoon at it and killed it. Whereupon people paid homage to him and made him their ruler. Because he killed the fish, people said he was a Muslim and that his, dis and that his descendants apost apostatized after his death. Um, hold on a second. Let's look up apostatized. Because I don't know what every word always means. Do, do, do. Give me a second because we need to figure out something in relation to this. What does apostatize mean? Looking it up for a quick definition to abandon one's religion. Oh, OK, there we go. Because I was wondering, like in the first in the first page we read from this, it was saying that none of the kings were Muslim. Remember, like and in the, uh, like the first 14 kings were not Muslim. Then the 15th one converted to Islam. Now it makes sense. And I was like, man, I thought the dude I'm pretty sure I've read this epic before. And this guy was a Muslim at first. So what happened? All right. Well, now here we go. And plus, we're actually reading from the epic. This clears up that Babylon, the Timbuktu thing, showing it wasn't he wasn't a Jew. Like it wasn't a Jew from Yemen that came. It was a Muslim. And we're reading that from the actual primary source. Uh, but apostatized means that they they left the faith. OK, so it's letting you know that his descendants stopped being Muslims. They left the faith. They did not return to being Muslims again till after 14 kings, so the 15th one converted to Islam, okay? So we know that this dude had to come probably around, these brothers probably came circa, six, circa 650 AD, 700 AD, roughly. Uh, all right, where are we at? Because he killed the fish, people said he was a Muslim and that his descendants apostatized after his death. We do not know which of them first did so, nor do we know which nor do we know when Zua Alaman quit the Yemen, nor when he reached them, nor what his true name was. The expression became a proper name for him, and the first part of it, Zua, a title for those rulers who succeeded him. They bred and multiplied to such an extent that only God Most High knows their number. They were distinguished by the strength, intrepidness, and bravery, and by their great height and heavy build. All who have knowledge of their circumstances and are familiar with the accounts relating to them are aware of this. Okay, so right there, we're just showing the, showing you clearing up the thing from Babylon to Timbuktu. And these people, eventually, the Sunghai would end up conquering Mali. And Mali would end up collapsing. All right, this is the last slide. The slide after this is the reference slide. Um, conclusion, after the collapse of Mali... 
the Mandate lands were thrown into a chaotic state. Former generals and vassalage chiefs attempted to fill the vacuum by establishing smaller states. This state of disarray led to many Mande becoming victims of the transatlantic slave trade, usually by capture from other groups, i.e. Fulani, Turags, Sunghai, directly by Europeans. And that was rare in the slave trade, but in the case of the Mande, you actually did have the two groups that had the most of Europeans actually capturing them because in the case, in most cases, uh, the Europeans were on the coast. They couldn't infl get into the interior and capture people. And so it was mostly either Hamites selling Israelites into slavery or it was Israelite uh, clans warring against each other for supremacy and um, selling the captives off into slavery. Um, also, you had... Um, people well that's not the point of size, so i'm not gonna go i'm not gonna go into that but um the two main groups where you actually had europeans sometimes capturing them directly would be the mande and the bakongo people down in the congo um with the portuguese to fill uh where are we at yeah, yeah and others wars with their wars wars where with their defeat the captives were sold into slavery and lastly, inter-Mande conflict. Uh, Mande, and so basically, so you had them being sold by other groups being captured. You also had them where they were in wars with their enemies. And, you know, if they lost, they got sold into captivity. And then lastly, inter-Mande conflict with them fighting, different Mande groups fighting amongst each other and, uh, you know, selling captives. Mande make up one of the six major groups of Israelites brought to the United States as slaves, the other five being Akan, Fang, Bakongo, Yoruba, and Igbo. They also formed a large portion of the slaves brought to Mexico and Central America. Um, and briefly, I have on there discussed Amistad slash Bible. If you look into the case of the Amistad, um, the slave ship that uh, where the people, they have the rebellion and they ended up being set free, you know, look into it. Those slaves were Monday slaves. Uh, they were primarily Mende um, from Sierra Leone region, Liberia region. Um, and then I have on here with discussing the Bible, just quickly that uh, the Israelites all throughout the Bible got in trouble for worshiping false gods. And it predicted that. And so it's like now we have basically our people we have of our people Muslims, which is not the not our original religion. Then we also have the pagan stuff with the I call it Uga Booga, but with the uh, with the voodoo and other things, though, the juju or whatever you want to call it. That's not our original religion either. And then you have others of us who practice Sunday Christianity, which is also not our original religion, which is something that the Roman Empire created blending paganism with our actual original religion but that's a story for another day so i'm just pointing out that the scriptures talk about that uh, even to the point even with uh it says that we will go into other lands and that we will worship other gods wood and stone whether that wood and stone is an actual idol or whether that wood is a cross or whether that stone is the kaaba that you go kiss in mecca whatever it may be we need to come back to our true religion which is worshiping the true God of Israel and following the commandments as listed in the Bible. Um, yeah. And I'll close. You can look up on your own in Zephaniah chapter three. It talks about the Israelites from beyond the rivers of Cush. And that's what we've been talking about in this lesson and in many in all many lessons. And it talks about how in the last days when Christ returns, um, he's going to gather his worshipers, the Israelites who live beyond the rivers of Cush. That's who we're, we've been talking about the whole time. All right. And now we're going to move on to the reference page and close out. All right. Here's the reference page. I'm going to leave it up for a second. I'm only going to read this bottom part from um, when Joab chased the Philistines. Um, just showing you that that was an actual source that he did chase them into Northwest Africa. Um, at the bottom, I have it highlighted. Rabbi Joseph Schwartz in his book, Tabut Hariz. Jerusalem 1845 says, according to the accounts of people of repute and worthy of all confidence, 
and who, and who continually arrive from Morocco to Jerusalem, it is a certain and well-known fact that near the region of Zagara in the kingdom of Fez in Morocco, there is an inscription in Asherite letters engraved on a stone tablet which says, up to here, I, Joab, son of Zuriah, pursued the Philistines. All right, I hope this lesson was uh, not gave you knowledge and insight. Shalom and be blessed.